I have a friend named Carver Mead, Carver Mead, who invented the circuits which made computers possible. And he's, uh, he's quoted on the internet as saying, it's very easy to have a complex idea. It's very difficult to have a simple one. I will, I will <clears throat> talk to you about the simple version of Macomb. It starts with the idea that people don't always know exactly who they are or why they do what they do. They can always think of a reason for why they're doing what they're doing, but it's not, it's usually may not be the real reason. If you become very, very skillful at giving these reasons that are not real, you could have a successful career in politics. A man named J.P. Morgan once said, everybody has two reasons for everything they do, a good reason and the real reason. So Hakomi starts with the fact that people don't always know why they do what they do or why they feel what they feel, etc. This is not an easy idea to accept about yourself, <clears throat> but there are many traditions, spiritual traditions, based on this fact, based on you, you, you seek to discover who you really are. And the premise is, if you do discover who you really are and why you really do things, you will suffer less. So Hakomi is devoted to this idea <clears throat> of helping people discover who they are. As practitioners, we attempt to assist people in the process of discovering themselves. It takes a good deal of courage to, take a, to, to discover who you are. Many of our behaviors are protective and we will come up against those when we try to discover who we are. <clears throat> Often we discover very painful memories, and these memories <clears throat> have created habits in us to deal with the pain. So, when, when we are practitioners in this method, we have to do three things very well. We have to help clients feel safe. We have to help them feel that they're being uh, listened to and looked at and appreciated and uh, protected. We, we have to help them feel that way. That's the first thing. This helps them to be ready to, to study themselves. The second thing we have to be very good at is helping people see who they are. Thank you understand who they are. And the method Hakomi uses is unique. We do what we call little experiments with the client in a state of mindfulness. Mindfulness is, is simply a, a vulnerable, self-aware state. The client studies their experience without trying to control it. And with the client in a mindful state, we offer some kind of experiment, maybe it's a statement, or maybe it's some kind of movement, <clears throat> which we believe will evoke a reaction in the client that tells the client about himself, about himself or herself. And we have to be able to get information about the client that allows us to do these little experiments. We have to make guesses about what the client's beliefs are, what the client's history is. We have to make guesses about which habits the client developed to handle their pain, their early experiences that are still active. And we do this in a very special way. Since we don't have faith that the client knows themselves very well, we don't ask them to tell us, because they'll only give us the reasons and the story they know. They can't tell you the real reason. If they could tell you the real reason, they wouldn't have to come to you in the first place. So we have to guess about the client. But we train ourselves to become very good guessers. What I like to do is look at the person and listen to their tone of voice, watch their facial expressions and their gestures, get a lot of information from their nonverbal behavior. We call these nonverbal behaviors indicators. 
people are walking around, living their lives, doing everything they do, <clears throat> and they are demonstrating, they're expressing these indicators constantly, all the time. I'll give you three or four examples. Suppose a person habitually sits like this. I know the chin. What if they always sit like this? The chin they, they hold their head like this. What if they talk very uh, 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 slow and, uh, and uh, edit, edit what they're saying? <laughs> What if their face always looks like this? And their voice sounds like this. Know. And their characters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indicator. And as you, as you uh, practice this method, you learn about a lot of indicators. So you learn to be very good guessers about what these indicators mean. Because we test our guesses. We, we do little experiments that tell us if we're right or wrong. The person who holds their head like this all the time, my guess, what does would be say so well? they don't trust people. So, if I want to test my idea, I ask the client to become mindful, give me a signal when they're ready. I ask them to notice their immediate reaction. I would say, please notice your immediate reaction when I tell you you can trust me. Now, if their belief system is they can't trust anybody, and I tell them they can trust me, they're very likely to notice a reaction. They might have two kinds of reactions. In my experience, they, they might either hear a voice that says, don't believe him, or have a thought like that, don't believe him. or they might even suddenly feel fearful. But in either case, they've discovered they don't trust me. And if you just ask the person in ordinary conversation, do you trust people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I trust people. They might say it like this. They modulate. You know, they, they're telling you, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's our purpose. Our purpose is to bring these things into consciousness. The person might also remember a very serious betrayal in their life, which taught them not to trust people. So one reaction might be a memory, a painful memory. Bringing that memory into consciousness <clears throat> does a lot to help the person understand it. So, now I don't have to just I don't have to just give them a verbal experiment. Instead, I could ask the person to become mindful and very slowly bring their head up and their eyes forward so they're looking straight at it. And since this is a protective posture, with skepticism. And then as the person brings his or her head up, they'll begin to feel afraid because they're giving up their protection. So one of the outcomes of these experiments, very often, the client is overwhelmed by some kind of emotion. They might start out feeling a little sad, or they might even notice, they may not even notice they're sad, but you notice it. It begins with the, some redness around the nostril, a slight shift in the voice, and some wetness in the eyes. And once the client becomes emotional, we have to use our the third set of skills. Remember, the first one was making the client safe. The second one was doing good experiments. And the third one is helping people resolve these emotional issues. That's my belief. That's my belief. That once an emotional process starts from this self-awareness, from this kind of awareness, when an emotional process starts on that basis, you have an opportunity to heal some hurt. I think of that as a healing process. It's a very natural process. And if the person doesn't feel safe or taken care of in the right way, they may, they may interrupt the process because it's painful. But part of the method is to learn these uh, the skills that allow you to help somebody's healing process come to a successful completion. Or the person who's distrustful, the process might go through fear, and end up with the realization that I, indeed, you can trust me. You can trust at least one person. And I want to tell you, 
<clears throat> that those healing processes end up with people feeling wonderful. They feel relief, they feel happiness, they feel peaceful and relaxed in their bodies. And the belief changes. It's not that you can't trust anybody. There's pe there are people you can't trust, and there are people you can't trust. That's a much more realistic belief. For the person who feels sadness, <clears throat> for the person who feels sadness, there's some relief in being held while they cry, and they remember these painful incidents, and being safe and cared for at the same time that you're remembering these painful experiences while you're feeling your sadness, all of that allows you <clears throat> to make sense of, of what happened. So you don't have to protect yourself against it. And the client's mind will find some way <clears throat> to accept what happened. Very often there's a, a, a belief about something they'll never be able to have, or something they'll never be able to get over, or something they'll never be able to be. And that belief changes. And they have a belief that they're a bad person, that it was all their fault. I've had people who are experiencing very, very deep grief. Five or ten minutes of sobbing. Very spontaneously they'll realize and say, it wasn't my fault. And that's relief. That's how healing happens. And that's the third skill we have to be good at. Supporting healing processes. Because when we do experiments, we often evoke a healing process. We make a guess Can I see? healing process, and that's as simple as it gets. So, if there are any questions or comments, I'd be happy to listen to. To a good argument, there's no reply.